How's it going? Uh, haven't made a, a video in a little bit. I feel like it's something that it uh, hasn't missed my mind, certainly, but it's it's something that uh, not a lot of people think about. So when you know when someone goes to prison, they they eventually the majority statistics say that the majority of people, about ninety five percent, they go to prison, and get out eventually. Um, only five percent are, are either sentenced to the death penalty or sentenced to actual life. So. 95% of prisoners do get out, but there's a problem with that, and that's the whole basis of recidivism. Of you know, it's uh, if you are released from prison or a period of custody, and then you commit a new crime within three years, then technically you're you're recidivate. You've you've you know uh, fallen into that category of, of someone that that uh, has went back to, to jail or to prison. And that's what I want to talk about today. That part is of, of going back to prison, um, and what that looks like, and what it means, and what it can mean for you. And and it's something that that you know I've known a lot of people that have been in and out of jail and prison, <laughs> and some never. I, I guess they never really get out of that that dryer that that cycle that wave cycle of being in and out of custody, and it's it's never. It's never a good thing to do that, but it does happen for a reason, and uh, that's that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So, um, going back to prison is not something that that you know you have this maybe this like euphoric kind of a high or a feeling when you're released because you're getting out, you're able to you know interact with people again, you may be able to see relatives you haven't seen in a long time, you you know a lot of things start to come back. You may get a job that you like. Um, may find a woman, may have a, a family, um, you may move somewhere else. A lot of different things can happen in the time from when you're released to when you would go back. Different states and places are they have different recidivism rates, and that's important because <clears throat> you know if you judge a Department of Corrections system based on the quality of the product they create, you know, put into business terms, basically, the product that, that a prison creates is, is, is an inmate, is an ex-con, is a convict, is a parolee, is, you know, uh, uh, someone who's been incarcerated, locked up, arrested, what have you. Um, the product that they make, a lot of this is dependent on the person, but some places are, you know, the, the things that come to someone's mind the absolute last place that I would ever want to go to prison is a prison, but the last place I'd want to go to prison would be Texas. They don't have air conditioning in Texas, and it's Texas. It's hot. I'm not a tropical person, never have been, never liked hot weather. But that's the thing that people deal with is they, they get out, they, they start a new life for themselves, and it may be a good productive life, or it may be one that, you know, they're just kind of waiting to get for the hammer to fall to go back. So, but those things, those things do happen and people are released. They are left to their own devices, I guess. And then something may or may not happen where, they, where they're, they're brought back. So I want to talk about how that can happen and, and in my experience and what that looks like. <laughs> so when you're, when you're arrested, you know, and you go through the criminal justice process that we have, you know, the arraignment. The reading of the charges, the the um, you have the indictment read to you. If you're not indicted already, um, you know you you go to a grand jury at some point and you get indicted. Um, or you may get charged by information, which is a different process, but it's more or less the same thing. Um, and then you're you're sent to the bigger court, and then you go through the the process, whatever it may entail. Um, police have done their investigation at that point, or maybe they're still investigating. And then you finally get arrested, you go through the trial process, or you plead guilty, however that works out. And then you're given some kind of a sentence, whether it's a day or a year or 10 years or whatever it may be. Um, majority of people that go to prison don't serve all that time. And it's something a lot of people, <laughs> I think they don't understand that. And, and whether it's due to, you know, the state statutes or the rules that the corrections agency may have, um, you know, you know, with, with, good time or earned time or how, whatever it's called, you're given credit off of your sentence for different things that you may do, whether it's being good, whether it's working, whether it's um, educational achievements that you've been able to, to, to do. Um, 
other things that may that may come up. Um, you're given time off of your sentence because honestly, it's expensive. It's expensive to house a prisoner. It's not something that states it's something they have to do, and it's something they devote a large budget. It's the equivalent of like a, st a state's defense bill is public safety. Um, you know, so we're in the in the federal government. We have the defense bills, which are the army and the navy and those kinds of things. In a state, you have public safety, which is police, fire, EMS, corrections, uh, you know, transportation, those kinds of things. Um, it's a big part of the state's budget or an agency's budget, and it's expensive. I think the last statistics that I remember reading recently, they were recent, but they were in Kentucky, and it was around twenty-six thousand dollars a year to house an inmate in a state prison. And you look at the population of state prisoners, the people that are under supervision, you can kind of see where the math adds up. Um, it gets prohibitively expensive to house someone. And so if you have the option of housing them or giving them parole or some other form of release, then, you know, that's probably going to happen if it's subject to something that, that's, that's, I guess, of the, uh, the thing to do. I mean... It's not for everyone because everyone isn't a good parole risk. Um, and there's demonstrations of that, and that's going to be looked at when when you're evaluated for that. But <clears throat> So you get out, you do all these things, live in your life, and then say you didn't go to your parole officer when you're supposed to, which happens. Say he or she comes by and you pee a hole right through the cup, right? So your urine's hotter than hell. And you just you had a couple joints, or you had a hit of something, or whatever you did, and they test for it, and you get violated. Um, it can be something a condition of the parole or the or the, the sentence from the original trial court where you didn't pay restitution, you didn't pay court costs or fines, those kinds of things. Um, those could potentially result in a violation, which could send you back. And then you have new charges that can send you back. And that, that typically is the thing that does send a lot of people back. A lot of states have moved away from technical violations because it's, it's, it's like, um, it's like being tardy in school. I mean, it's not, it's not to take it away that it's not important to obey the conditions of release because it is, but I mean, the, the, just the economics of sending someone to prison for a urine test a lot of places have found that it doesn't make any sense and it's not really fiscally responsible either. It makes a lot more sense to put them in some kind of a program to kind of intensify some, some programs maybe they might be in to um, maybe increase some sanctions, uh, to have a curfew, put someone in jail for a period of time. That's what a lot of places do is they do you know, a short-term jail, basically. Um, a lot of other things that the parole officers and parole agencies have at their discretion to use, but it's, it seems like there, there's a, a movement to kind of reverse this thing of well you you make you made a mistake or something happened um, or a small violation in the grand scheme of things and we're gonna send you back to prison because that really isn't very smart to do that for lots of reasons. Um, but you have these conditions of release and you're expected to go buy them. But well, a lot of times what will happen is you have a new charge that will violate that, <laughs> and so. In Kentucky, it's kind of strange because you can be out on parole and your parole officer may or may not even ever find out that you've been arrested. Um, it does happen sometimes with people that I've known that I've been, you know, in prison with or in jail with, and they're, you know, they're there on a parole violation. Um, or they've, they're on parole and they've gotten a new charge and the parole officer hasn't come down there with a warrant from the parole board saying, hey, we're, you know, revoking your parole or, or uh, whatever that has, that happens after a hearing, you have to have a hearing in order for that to happen first. But a parole officer can do that at that point, can can uh, ask the judge to basically not let you out because you depends on the situation, but you can be a flight risk at that point because you're not looking at just you know 60 days in jail for a DUI. You're looking at years because if they violate you on the DUI, then you've got years of your time left that's that's hanging over your head from the drone parole for in the first place. So. Um, they look at that a little bit differently. Um, I've known people that were brought back to jail or brought, brought back to prison for very silly minor things in the grand scheme of things. And, and they were violated. And they did have to go back to prison and, and start that over. Kentucky, your street time, your time that you spend on the street while on parole, if you're brought back because of a new charge to prison, that time doesn't count. So it's like it never happened. And that 
gets into a bunch of kind of strange math as far as adding up your time and calculating how much time you have left, how much time do you have before you see the parole board again. Um, most commonly what's going to happen is when you're rearrested for a new charge, for instance, is that the parole board is going to violate your parole. They may or may not, but more often than not, they are. And then they're going to give you a deferment. They're going to say, we want to see you again in 12 months, 24 months, or a period of time later um, before they'll consider giving you parole again. And they're going to have to slide everything around as far as your numbers with your time once that happens because you spend some time on the street, but then you have this new charge, but then it gets all kinds of goofy. So um, when you come back to prison, you know, and that's the other thing is that when you come back, if it's because of a new sentence, you're going to have a lot of different things going on in your mind and, and, and in your life at that point, you know, as far as I, I've got, you know, three years left on parole, but then I've got this new charge that I just pled guilty to because I was dead to rights or because a trial happened or whatever the case was. <laughs> so now you got 13 years. And, and that's not a fun thing to think about. But you did it yourself, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you're innocent. I don't know you. Uh, hopefully you're innocent. You didn't do it. And they found the guy. <laughs> but it, it's, it's something that does happen every single day in this country. And for good or bad, it, it, it's where our system's set up. So, you know, parole is an old French word that means promise. You, it, It's not a right. But practically speaking, a lot of people are given parole in some form whether it's mandatory, discretionary, um, whatever the case may be, the majority of people are going to get out of prison at some point, whether serving the sentence out, given parole, or something else. You're not going to uh, you know, stay in prison forever for stealing a candy bar from a gas station. But coming back to prison is not a good thing. And, and it, it, I can tell you from, from speaking for myself and a lot of other people probably, the thought of, of being back in a jail is is more than nauseating. It, it's, it's, you know, there's a guy that was just arrested after uh, he he uh, killed someone. I was in a, was engaged in a like a, a hostage or a standoff kind of a thing. And his words, he said, "I'm not going back." Uh, he ended up surrendering and surrendering peacefully. And now he's back in custody for, now he's got a murder charge. Um, so that is real. A lot of people hear that when they see something happen on the news or see a relative or a friend of theirs that's been to prison and they, they say, we well, said he wasn't going back. So he pulled a gun out on the cops. Why would someone do that? Because in their mind, in that situation, the thought of being dead was better than going back to prison and wearing handcuffs or wearing a jumpsuit again and that's that should tell you a lot it's not you know, people have a lot of this thing in their mind that jail or prison is, is a happy fun place and that there's you know sunbathing and tvs and it's all club fed and you get all this good stuff going on and that isn't the case that isn't what happens so people go to prison or jail and they don't want to go back but then something happens whether it's through no fault of their own or through every fault of their own and they may have a chance of going back um, what that does, hopefully, is it instills something in you that I don't want to go back. So I'm, it's not that I'm not going to get caught for something. It's I'm not going to do anything to get caught for in the first place. Um, I guess that's a, a, a thinking evaluation issue that if you change your thinking and change your actions, then you're going to change the results. That probably sounds like a self-help thing or something, but, you know, it's just it's, it's, it's me saying how I feel about it. The thought of going back to jail or prison is, is something that's pretty scary, honestly. And and I know that if I did, it would be, you know, I don't know what it would be for, honestly. I'm not a violent person. I don't do drugs. I, you know, I I don't steal anything anymore. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, I don't drink and drive, certainly. So I really don't know what it would be for. Um... Everyone has stressors and things that happen in their lives and they, they get in a situation, they react to those things. And then that may or may not be something that's that's good or legal or, or rational. Um, I like to think that I'm a lot better at not falling into those things and controlling my emotions and, and being a lot more in tune with that um, because I feel like that's honestly what got me in trouble 
you know, back in 2009 is that I wasn't in control of my emotions. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, a speaker. It's a, it's a daily struggle, honestly, um, with people you meet in a store, with your friends, your family, relatives, uh, you know, significant others, those kinds of things, um, to, to not let those emotions override, you know, your, your thought and your thought and your, your mind and your, your speech and your actions. So, um, going back to prison is not something anyone wants to do. And, and it, it, you know, it almost seems like, I guess, from a, a former insider looking out, looking in, I guess, that a lot of people think that prison is this grand old place and it's not. People literally kill themselves to not go back to prison, but it's something that happens. It's something that, that could happen to anyone. You could be arrested. I could be arrested today, right now. Um, if it happens, it happens. I'll deal with it, I, you know, but um, it's not something you want to have happen, but it's something that could. And hopefully you're wiser and better. It's been, you know, almost six years since I've, since I've been out, uh, right at, you know, five and a half years now. I like to think that I'm over that. Um, you know, but there's people that I was in prison with that went years, decades uh, between incarcerations, and they came back. Um, you know, whether it was for cultivating marijuana or for murder or whatever it may have been, um, they have a record when they're when they're younger. They go a great period of time, and then something happens, and they find themselves in this situation. Man, you know, manufacturing methamphetamine, growing marijuana, whatever it may be. Um, and there's a bed for you. There's a place for you. They always have a bed, something that they never run out of, uh, whether it's on the floor or in a, in a bed. It's there. It's not just that's not the bed that I want is, is the reason that I don't go back. So what are your all's thoughts? Make some comments down below and I'll definitely respond back. Thanks.